In this video, we're going to talk about neurotransmitters, another very important communicator in the brain. As we hinted at a few times in our previous video, in neurotransmission, electrical events happen within neurons, and that's all the stuff about action potentials and the signals traveling down the axon, all of that good stuff. But chemical events happen between neurons, and it's those chemical events between neurons that we're going to focus on in this video. So we talked about the process of the synaptic vesicle, which is the uh, sort of taxi, the Uber, the Lyft that contains those neurotransmitters traveling down each neuron, bursting at the axon terminal in the synapse, releasing those neurotransmitters. Now I want to kind of talk a little bit more about what it means for the dendrites to, quote, receive the signal from the previous neuron. And what this really means is there's neurotransmitters floating around in the synapse, and there's receptor sites on the dendrites of the next neuron that are sort of ready to accept the correct neurotransmitters. And the relationship between neurotransmitter and receptor site is kind of the same as the relationship between a lock and a key. In this case, the neurotransmitter is the key, and the receptor site is the lock. Now, the reason I use this metaphor is because each receptor site only works with a particular type of neurotransmitter. I'm going to go over a bunch of different kinds of neurotransmitter uh, examples in just a second, but what I want you to keep in mind is that you can't have the wrong neurotransmitter on the wrong receptor site. There's one neurotransmitter that works with one particular type of receptor site. And this is going to be important in a little bit because when we talk about psychoactive drugs, they operate in a way that affects those receptor sites to either enhance or block neurotransmitter activity. But before we get ahead of ourselves, let's talk about the different types of neurotransmitters. This is not going to be an all-inclusive list, but I want to give you an idea, just a flavor of some of the very uh, different sorts of functions that neurotransmitters have. So let's start here with glutamate. Glutamate is the main excitatory neurotransmitter, and it's involved in a bunch of stuff, including the relay of sensory information and in learning. And for each of these different types of neurotransmitters, I'm going to give you a little application or two. Why should we care about these types of neurotransmitters as psychologists? So one application is that glutamate at extremely high levels can be a very bad thing in that it can contribute to the development of schizophrenia and other psychological disorders. Next we have GABA, which is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter. And GABA is involved in learning, in memory, and in sleep. So again, very important sorts of functions. In terms of applications, we know that alcohol increases GABA activity. And anti-anxiety drugs bind to GABA receptors, suppressing overactive brain areas linked to worry. So again, we can take advantage of neurotransmitters by developing drugs, for example, that affect them in different ways to produce results that we want. Next, we have acetylcholine. This is a neurotransmitter that's important for uh, two different sorts of functions, muscle contraction and cortical arousal. And I want to break up that word here, uh, cortical arousal. Cortical comes from cortex, basically just meaning brain. And arousal doesn't necessarily mean sexual arousal. When we in psychology talk about arousal, we typically just mean activation. So here, cortical arousal means brain activation. In terms of applications, Botox causes paralysis by blocking acetylcholine and memory-enhancing drugs increase acetylcholine activity. So again, taking advantage of those two different uh, sorts of functions, muscle contraction and cortical arousal. Next, we have norepinephrine. This is a neurotransmitter important for, again, cortical arousal, and also for other functions, some of which are automatic, including mood, hunger, and sleep. And as we'll see, there are several different neurotransmitters that are important for uh, overlapping sorts of functions, including mood. In terms of applications, as an example, methamphetamine, or meth for short, increases norepinephrine activity. So think about the effects of norepinephrine and the effects of meth in terms of cortical arousal, mood, sleep, things like that. Here's one you might have heard of before, dopamine. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter important for motor function and reward. This latter portion, the reward piece, being uh, part of the reason we call it the pleasure neurotransmitter. But as with everything, it's all about balance. Not enough dopamine and too much dopamine are very detrimental. 
As examples, we're going to talk about psychoactive drugs in just a minute, but drugs that increase dopamine activity are used to treat Parkinson's disease, while drugs that block or reduce dopamine act activity or action are used to treat schizophrenia. So again, we can take advantage of what we know about these different neurotransmitters to improve people's lives physically and psychologically. Next, another one you might have heard of before, very famous, very important one for a lot of different things, including depression. I'll get to that in a second. Serotonin. This neurotransmitter is important for, again, mood, aggression, and some of those automatic functions like temperature regulation and sleep cycles. So thinking about depression, obviously things like mood and sleep are very relevant here. And so we've taken that to develop SSRIs. SSRI stands for Serotonin Selective Reuptake Inhibitor. And this is an antidepressant. It's used to treat depressant. Now, this is uh, depression, excuse me. Now, this is a little bit confusing. Reuptake inhibition. I'm going to get to that in just a second. Uh, so just keep that in the back of your mind. As one last example of a neurotransmitter, we have anandamide. This is a neurotransmitter with effects including pain reduction and an increase in appetite. What does this remind you of? Well, marijuana, right? THC, which is found in marijuana, produces euphoria and pain reduction, good feelings, and also gives you the munchies. It increases your appetite. So again, a lot of these things coming up in daily life. So let's get to those psychoactive drugs as the last little topic for this video. Psychoactive drugs are drugs that interact with neurotransmitter systems that I've been talking about to influence mood, arousal, or behavior. So I'm going to give you two different types of psychoactive drugs, which this categorization is based on how they operate, how they interact with those neurotransmitter systems. Some psychoactive drugs are agonists, meaning they increase receptor site activity. How can they do this? Here's a couple examples. They can either bind to receptor sites to mimic neurotransmitters, like this is how morphine works, but essentially you're pretending to be dopamine, for example. So you fit that lock. You find the shape of that key to fit that lock. It's synthetic, but it ends up producing the same effect. Or you can be an agonist by blocking the reuptake of neurotransmitters. This is what I was talking about in the example of SSRIs. Reuptake basically means recycling. So if there's serotonin that hasn't been used in the synapse, at some point the brain says, okay, let's get rid of those, let's recycle them, let's reuptake. But if you're someone with depression, you might just have an imbalance of neurotransmitters such that you don't have enough serotonin operating in the brain. So we don't at any point want to really get rid of or recycle that serotonin. We want to leave it in the brain, in the synapses, as long as possible to give them more chances to take effect. This is how reuptake inhibition works. That's how SSRIs work. Last but not least, a psychoactive drug can also be an antagonist, meaning it decreases receptor site activity. This can happen again in a variety of ways, but the primary way that you can be an antagonist is by binding to a receptor site to block it. Imagine, for example, putting a hot glue gun in a lock, letting it dry, and then trying to stick your key in that lock. It's not going to work, right? This is how some treatments and medications for schizophrenia work, by binding to dopamine receptor sites, since we know that too much dopamine is associated with schizophrenia, and therefore blocking dopamine from binding to them.